okay so this uh this session is uh, simply just an introduction to the tools we'll be using this week i'll conduct it mainly as a discussion if you're in uh, the morning tutorial with the abba uh, the the three main tools we'll be using this week were mentioned and uh, i think we did get uh, to know what uh, each is and uh, this session is just uh, understanding why we will be needing each each tool for this week and uh, how exactly we will use them so i i think from tomorrow we'll go deeper into each tool and how exactly we'll be used the coding part but they will just do a general discussion on what they are and how they can help us for our challenge this week so before i start a presentation i have a small presentation if you have also seen um, the explanation notebook in the week 9 folder that's the notebook we'll be using uh, for this class but uh, before i start that presentation maybe i can just open the floor for a discussion and ask um, if we all know the three tools that are uh, and skill that we'll be basically using in this week could i have just a volunteer to tell us the three tools that we'll be using in this week Ah, okay, Daisy, Daisy from the chat. Airflow, Kafka, and Spark. That is correct. This has been listed in the challenge document. This basically, there are many other tools and skills used in data engineering, but for this week, we'll be basically uh, concentrating on uh, these three tools. So if I may just ask, because uh, I know there's one tool that we'll be mainly focusing on, what we will be mainly building uh, our data pipeline on. Of the three, do we know which one it will be our major focus on uh, this week? The, the one that will be actually using the others to ensure it runs. Do we know which should be the main, the main tool for this week? Anyone? Okay, yes, yes, Meron. Meron, uh, Daisy says Spark. Meron says Kafka. We have Remet saying Kafka. Okay, so I see it splits. And um, so mainly what we'll be using this week is Kafka. We'll be focusing on creating the Kafka clusters. If you have gone through the challenge document, what we'll be doing uh, in Kafka is, I think that is task uh, task two. I think that should be task two. Yeah, so it has outlined what you'd actually need to do when using Kafka, what you will, uh, yes, that is task two, what you will need to do using Kafka. So just to ask again, Kafka, what is Kafka? Can we have an explanation from anyone in the group of what Kafka is and why exactly do we need it in this week's challenge? Should I assume that silence means we don't know what Kafka is? Okay, so I'll assume that means we don't know what Kafka is. We'll just, oh, Meron, Meron, nice. Meron, you raised the hand. <laughs> Meron. Okay, it's just what I, re what I read and... Kafka is basically, it's used as a transportation mechanism and it's used to move data really fast at a scale. Uh, so basically when we have a lot of source systems and many target systems uh, and they all need to exchange data, uh, it gets complicated and Kafka is used to solve this issue by providing uh, the mechanism of transporting it transporting the data and the target systems can get the data from uh, the Kafka. That's what I understood so far. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you for that, Meron. That's a good uh, simplification of what uh, Kafka does and what it will help us do in this challenge. So can we have anyone else who have anything else to add before I move on to just introducing the other tools? Any addition? Okay, I'll assume silence means uh, that uh, no one is... Uh, contributing to that question. So next, uh, for Airflow and Spark, do we know why we need Airflow and Spark for this week's challenge? Can I get anyone to tell me why do we need Airflow and someone else to tell me why we need uh, Spark? So you did hear you're saying that uh, for information in a distributed manner, what is uh what are you describing? You did hear? Uh okay, uh, Spark is mainly used, I think, to the, to make some kind of transformation or some kind of pre-processing of the data that has been ingested. Okay, thank you for that. And uh, Airflow, DZ says Airflow is used for scheduling of tasks. So this is just uh, an overview of what you're building. And I know it's basically when you talk about uh, other things like Spark, you might find that Spark might do, might do some form of scheduling as well. And uh, over the past few weeks, I've had questions asked, why do we need to learn so many tools when one tool can actually do everything and uh, that's the example of airflow and spark spark can do scheduling but uh, why we need to introduce airflow so in addition to the the additional functions of spark we are introducing airflow because this is actually a widely used tool in the data engineering community and it is just nice to actually have a know-how of this specific uh, Tool. So don't go asking, why do we need Airflow yet? I know Spark can do this and that. Why do I need Spark? I can do this with that. So that's why we are introducing these three tools because they are mainly used in the data engineering community. So for those who had chosen the data engineering path, this is actually a very important trick for you guys. So I'll just share my screen and we'll dive a little bit deeper into Kafka and then touch just a little bit on Airflow and Spark because as we have said, we'll mainly use Airflow to schedule our tasks and we'll mainly use Spark for the data pre-processing, but everything, uh, what we'll be creating will be based on Kafka. So we'll just do uh, somehow just understanding what Kafka is uh, deeply. So let me just share my screen. Okay, so I hope you can see my screen. Can you see my screen? I'm not yet. Let me just stop and start again. How about now? Can you see my screen? Oh, what's going on? Let me just switch to another window. Maybe it's the Firefox that I'm using. Let me try and use uh, Chrome. So 
So you can see my screen now. I think you can see my screen now. Yeah, you can see your screen. Oh, OK. OK. Because I'll just go and start with that notebook. OK, so just a brief introduction of Kafka and what it is, why we need it for this week's challenge. And that's uh, just a brief introduction where it came what it is. Like Meron had said, it is just a transportation mechanism, what uh, they describe it as a, a publish and subscribe based uh, durable messaging system. And uh, what like Meron had just said, it just means it's used uh, for transportation. And a small history about Kafka is that it was developed by the LinkedIn data engineers and uh, right now it's called Apache Kafka because uh, it's being supported uh, by Apache just like uh, Airflow and Spark even if they started from uh, different uh, backgrounds. So the main thing about uh, Kafka is that it offers this uh, high throughput and uh, what we mean by health high throughput is the use of automated equipment to rapidly process thousands to millions of samples from data points. So by the fact that uh, Kafka has this high throughput, it actually makes it a powerful tool because uh, it, it helps process uh, live data. This is real-time data, streaming data. And uh, this, uh, this approach of actually being able to process live data, real data, has actually been, uh, it has come up to be more popular because uh, you might find in some businesses that um, 
uh, data from yesterday is already late and uh, we need data that is uh, happening at the moment. So you might find, for example, because uh, systems and companies that use Kafka, we have the example of Netflix. And then maybe an example of how they use it is when you open, when you open one movie and immediately you get a recommendation of other movies that are actually in the same genre or just the same type of that movie. So they use Kafka to actually help you with that kind of uh, real-time communication. Same thing with Uber. And you might find that maybe prices during certain times it hikes and it's so high and during certain times it is low because of uh, maybe the demand and Uber also uses Kafka for such kind of um, system to just check out what is going on, what can we say about now, how is it going on and uh, they tend to now hike their prices depending on uh, what's going on. So what just Kafka is, as this diagram shows, we have uh, this main part, the brokers, and we can just find that uh, two, two applications are communicating uh, with Kafka. So I wanted to go a little bit deeper into this diagram. This is what has been shared, but I just wanted to share another deeper diagram. Sorry that this is actually from YouTube, eh? but I hope you can see. I don't know if you can see it clearly. I uh, wanted to explain Kafka a little bit more with uh, this type of uh, diagram. I hope you can see it clearly before I start. Anyone? I think it's clear. Ah, okay, okay. So, like I've said, Kafka is a, a transportation mechanism and uh, it's actually used for communication between different uh, people. And when you talk about Kafka, really you'll hear about the words producers and uh, consumers. You might also hear the word connectors and stream processors and all of them are connected uh, with this Kafka cluster. So you'll notice that here we are saying Kafka cluster and here we had said uh, a broker. So the, just the difference between a uh, Kafka cluster and a uh, Kafka broker is that uh, we have one Kafka cluster, but within one Kafka cluster, we can actually have um, multiple brokers and then have each broker having its own topic. And uh, each topic can also have um, a number of partitions. So uh, the, 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 how we arrange that, that flow of, uh, that diagram flow is something like, uh, let me just see, it's something like uh, like this. So we have yeah, one cluster and in each cluster we have a number of brokers. In each broker we have a topic and each topic can have multiple partitions. That is how it flows. So when we go deeper into actually developing this, we look at uh, all the way deep up to how we actually develop that Kafka topic. So now that we've understood just uh, generally what's going on in the Kafka cluster, so I'll introduce how the others communicate uh, with the Kafka cluster. And I'll start with the producer. And our producer in this, uh, producer in this, in this Kafka uh, space is just uh, the things and the tools that uh, generate the data. And we could have this being maybe that uh, messaging system and emailing system. It could be a website like, uh, for example, in our week we'll have uh, your front-end application, which the user will be interacting with. We could have that being where our data is coming from. So anything that generates data will be our producer in this context. And that producer, whatever data they generate, they communicate that data to the Kafka cluster. It's, uh, it could be, when we say maybe, for example, a website, it could be triggered by events, maybe on a button click, and uh, maybe what happens, some data is generated. And uh, maybe when someone does, well, for example, if they record, if given them a sentence and they record and they say send and on that button click that event, then uh, whatever they just is becomes our data and is sent into the Kafka cluster. So the other thing, uh, I hope we've understood the producers, the other thing we have uh, is the consumers and the consumers just happen to be 
who is actually receiving this data. So since we've said that this is uh, done in a real-time application, you might find that any time you generate data, you might be maybe as well from the data that is being input, you also want to do an output of um, maybe a dashboard, some form of a graph. Or, uh, and so that's why we have one of our consumers could be something like an analytics dashboard, or maybe we could also do just a database to store your data. We could also use, for example, like in the Netflix. So you'll find anytime you, maybe you've I've said, I want to watch Karate Kid. And uh, that was my input. I just did Karate Kid and immediately they did some recommenders, recommender settings behind the scenes. And again, they output the other, other movies like Karate Kid to me uh, as a consumer. So the other thing we have on this side is uh, the connectors. And I really want uh, to, for us to look into the connectors because these are mainly used to actually connect with DBs. And this week we'll be connecting with the data lake S3 bucket. And, uh, Kafka gives these connectors uh, plugin for different databases. And depending on the database you want to use, there's a different connector. We'll just look into that uh, later, but it's good to just understand this concept. And uh, since I'm saying connectors, uh, they give the plugin to connect between databases and these Kafka clusters. You'll notice that databases store data in terms of tables and it's tables and rows and columns. And we all know how structured the databases look. And then Kafka, as we have just said, is mainly concentrated on the events, the topics, and um, maybe a message in that topic. So what this connector does is it takes, maybe if it's an input from a database, it takes that record from the database that could be one row. And then it gives it as a message to our topic. We'll be mainly concentrating on the topic. So the connectors might take that uh, one row and give it um, and give it uh, to Kafka cluster as a message in that topic. So I see, Meron, you're asking what uh, a topic is. And what a topic is, is basically, in simpler terms, it's like a table in databases, but then Kafka cl clusters calls them a topic. It is not a table. So the same way you'd think of a topic or maybe in a file management system, how you'd think of a file and that file has information in it. That is exactly what a topic is. It's just how Kafka refers to its form of, how can I say, organization. Instead of using maybe a table for the, struc the way they structured um, databases look or maybe calling it a file, like the file systems call it. So for Kafka, we, we refer to this as a topic. Is that clear, Meron? Okay, and you'll find that just like the tables have different rows, which represent different meanings, topics will also have uh, different states. And you might find maybe we want to, um, our, like for example, if we are creating a topic this week, we might want our, since uh, we'll be getting the, the text corpus from our database, we have our user record um, their audio and then that same audio is sent back to the database. So that topic is a topic that will now will hold the text corpus from the database. And then when an audio is uh, is recorded, the topic will also record will also hold the audio file before it sends it back to the database. And this is where the other arrow is showing. So that, as I said, the row, the row, the row or the record from the database is sent as a message to the topic. And if there's anything additional that the topic, like for example, our audio file, the cluster will store it in the topic, but then using the connectors, we can actually just send it back to the database as again, a row, uh, which is how the databases connect them. So I hope we've understood connectors. I think we'll be using that uh, for this week. And then on the other side, we have the stream processors. And this is where Spark 
might come in and what stream processors do is that uh, they transform data as they come in. So these stream processors are very helpful because as we have said, Kafka is mainly known because of its real-time capabilities. And these stream processors are coming because you might want, maybe you are reading that audio file. Like if you went to morning session, you might find that uh, somebody pressed play and they didn't record anything. So it's basically just blank audio. And you wouldn't want to just store blank audio into your database. So before storing that into your database, you might introduce now some form of uh, transformation or processing and just checking that data that has come in, what it is, do some transformation. Maybe, I, for example, I was thinking, and uh, if you look at the entire week's project, our main goal is to actually prepare this data in a way that it can be fed into a speech-to-text model. So you can go back and say, so I did make this model in week four, five, and my inputs, <laughs> My inputs maybe were the audio file, the transcription file. We did do maybe the length of that audio, the duration, everything that you did as an input to your model. You might also do that in, uh, in your transformation, in your data preprocessing. And then when you take, we have say you're taking the raw data from the producer, we now do the transformation using the stream processors. And this week, here, Spark will help us for that. Then you give Kafka again, that uh, transformed data, I'll call it transformed data, then Kafka can gain, store it into now our data lake, or maybe in a scenario where you want to do modeling direct, you can also now do modeling as a consumer. So I hope we've understood just uh, where Kafka comes in and how it actually connects all this. And this is actually important. Kafka becomes very important because you might find in situations where um, we have more multiple producers. You might be getting your data from uh, multiple locations and maybe you want to use it for different types of consumers. Like I've said, you might want to store it, you might want to use it for analytics, you might want to use it for other purposes. So instead of having different single systems to do everything for the input and output, maybe from the web to the from the web to the analytics, maybe from web to the database, that could be many different systems. And Kafka comes in to just make it one simple real-time system. So is that clear? I hope that is clear because that's basically what we'll be doing this week. I hope this is clear before I continue to where Airflow comes in. A confirmation maybe if we have a question on this architecture of our, how Kafka works. <clears throat> okay, so for now I'll assume that silence means we've understood or maybe you're just trying to process uh, what I've just said. And so I'll continue. So some of the, okay, so most, so it's a question from Meron, or is it, let me just read it. Okay. Oh, okay, so Meron, you're asking uh, that uh, Spark, it processes the raw data, right? But how does it just check the duration, length, and stuff? Not clear on what it does exactly. So, a simple way of looking at Spark is that it's like pandas for big data. Is uh, whatever we do, we do we use pandas to manipulate our data, our data frame to add a column to do this and that, and uh, we do so many things with panda. But what, but what uh, Spark does, it, it does the same thing but with more capability and it also does this in real time just like uh, Kafka, Kafka does. So when we say, when you're asking where does the duration, length and stuff come in, you will actually, you might decide to maybe go again and use Librosa and just generate this these things that you need maybe as input or metadata to your database and uh, you can handle all of that form of processing using Spark instead of uh, maybe pandas like we used back then. And then now 
erase, you store that into your connectors. Oh, sorry, into your database. So, uh, Ken, I'll, that's you've asked for that image again, but I see their hands up. So, you did, yeah. Did you have something to say or add? Uh, I'm sorry, maybe you, you might uh, talk about it on the next section, but I still don't exactly understand uh, the, the reason why we are using Spark in our challenge document, because we are only getting the audio files and we are not directly working on the audio files on Kafka or on Spark streaming, right? Uh, we cannot say we will not work on uh, the audio file. Uh, like I've just said, you might actually want to generate additional metadata for this audio file. And I've given an example of in week 4.5, when you are given an audio file, we did generate maybe what was the sample rates, what was the the duration of that audio, and so many other metadata, I think, Mm, that we generated in week 4 and 5. And you might want to do this before you store this data in your database. So like I've given that example of you did a model and uh, you did some form of transformation or pre-processing before you fed your data into that model. So you can just go ahead and do that form of pre-processing before you store your data into the databases now the S3 bucket because what we are trying to do is actually make a system that can be used directly for that speech to text model. So in a way of simplifying, you can look at it in that manner. Generate everything that's needed for the model and then store that into the database. Then that data can now be used to do uh, machine learning. Okay, so if I'm not wrong, we'll only be using Spark to generate some data about the data we have or the audio files that have been generated by the user. So when you say only use it for metadata, we'll be limiting the capabilities of Spark and we'd like to leave it open-ended just to explore Spark. That minimum, we'd actually expect you to use Spark to do that form of data pre-processing. But if you have time and if time allows this week, you can go ahead and uh, explore what Spark can do more and see if you can actually incorporate that into the week. Thanks. Okay. Any other question before I continue? Okay. So I hope uh, Ken, uh, that's enough. I'll go back to the notebook. And uh, so the main, okay. So the main, uh, the the explanation notebook gives a few other additional. Uh, definitions and uh, as i've explained uh broker this is what it's inside the cluster but it handles what happens now the communication between the producer the consumer the connectors and uh the stream processors the broker handles this but it handles this by having now like i'd said the topic each uh, each broker can have a topic and then each topic has multiple Partitions. The other word that is additional here we'll find is a uh, zookeeper. And what zookeeper does is uh, mainly just handle those pre -pro that those processes. Everything happening within the cluster is made possible by zookeeper. Something else that is additional, it is uh, another um, another form of how can I say? Um, it is a form of technology. Let me see the technology. I don't think that's the right word I was thinking about. Let me see the technology that now enables everything within the Kafka cluster to actually happen. I've explained what topics are and uh, what partitions are. They're just uh, those small sections that are within each topic. And then um, we also have the producer and the consumer. So to just explain a little bit more again, For the partitions. So what you are seeing here is different partitions. And like I've said, the partitions come inside a topic. So we have one topic and multiple partitions. So the reason for having multiple part partitions is that we might be having different form of events that you want to record. And uh, you might find that one partition is handling this type of event. One, so like here, the events have been uh, 
they have been represented in colors. You have the blue, purple, orange, and red. So these are just specific events uh, which have been represented by the partitions. And uh, here we have an example of producers. Like I've said, we might have that being a website. We might have that being just so many other things. And here they've been represented by a mobile phone. And I think this, this may, may, must be a smart car. I don't know how it could be produced unless it's a smart car, an electric car. And uh, we might have different producers uh, who are triggering the same event. And we can have different producers actually feeding into the same partition in one particular topic. So that's what this diagram is all about. So with that, that's just a general introduction of what Kafka is and how we'll be using for the week. I've also mentioned Spark, just a little bit of what it is. It has uh, other capabilities because I know Spark uh, Spark and its core can also do some machine learning. We also have, um, oh, this, this picture is too small. I don't know if I can zoom in. Oh, good. So yeah, Spark on its own has other capabilities and it, it has a way of actually dealing with a structured, uh, structured data using the Spark SQL, has a way of also dealing with machine learning if you want to do that directly. We also have a way of uh, dealing with a graph kind of processing the graph X and it also has uh, the streaming capabilities I had said, but this week we won't be going deeper into all of them will just be using it for its uh, data processing capabilities. Uh, they are DD. So something else additional I've not mentioned that we'll be using this week, I see our time is almost up, is Airflow. And uh, what Airflow basically is, is just uh, a scheduler. I think Daisy had mentioned this. And if you notice from our diagram, we expect maybe we get an event triggered from our platform, our online platform. And then when this event is triggered, we get some data from that event. This data, what we want it to do next is to go through some form of pre-processing before it is again given back to the Kafka cluster and then it is stored into our database. So that is basically our flow of events and we would like this to happen in a specific format. So instead of being now the person who's just there waiting for the data, you know, if it was a simple if it was a simple task and you maybe you can wait an entire day, then you go and now do the pre-processing yourself that could be possible but in in a, in a real application that might not be logic you need this to happen immediately the client records the user let me call them the user immediately the user records their audio you want that audio to immediately go through some form of pre-processing before again it is immediately stored into the database as a, in a form that is is suitable so that's automation of the entire process we can do that. That's where Airflow comes in. And now we schedule when this happens, what comes next? When this happens, what comes next? Just like I've explained. And how Airflow is able to achieve this is by the use of DAGs. So what DAG is, is just a directed a cyclic graphs. It's just a form of start here, go here next, do this, finish with this. That's what DAGs are in simple terms. So when you look at uh, DAGs, let me minimize this again. Okay. So when we look at DAGs, for example, here I've given an example of just uh, one DAG. And uh, in this, what DAG does is just run a, f a number of tasks that you've told it to do, and it runs it in a, some form of schedule. So in a DAG, you can just specify a few things like um, when should it start, maybe when it starts, who should be emailed, should we get an email when there is uh, some form of failure? Should we get an email when it should retry? Maybe if it fails, how long should we wait before we do the retrying? Maybe 
uh, the form of delay. You know, sometimes you can say a process should not wait, should not run for more than 10 seconds. So what happens after the 10 seconds? Should we just terminate that process? Do we wait another 20 seconds before we retry? So this is all, all these messages come in when you're taking to when you're thinking about automation and all this is set in the dark and um, yeah. So other capabilities of uh, airflow, I'll just go here. Like I was saying, what happens in the in the time of failure? So airflow will airflow with the help of DAGs will help us take care of failures. What happens when it fails? It will also help us monitor successes. What happens? No, just maybe just maybe a message that runs successfully, and it will do this maybe in form of logs. We also have the dependencies. So for for the Spark processes to start running. What does it depend on? It depends on some input from some producer. So any dependencies will also be handled by Airflow and um, maybe some form of deployment. So in our in our case, could be at the end of it all, we have a successful running. Everything is going well. We have this metadata generated. What happens next? Finally, we load this data into our S3 bucket. So all this will be handled within a DAG, which is um, how Airflow manages its work. So when we give this Apache Airflow something you need to know, when you're just exploring Apache Airflows, it gives you different form of views. We have um, DAGs views, which are these views just show you, it's this user interface just show you the, sorry, show you the list of DAGs present in your system. You could have one DAG that mainly does the, um, but let me see, maybe in, in our case, this might not be required, but we could have a DAG that does authentication and you're mainly just you're using this for authentication purposes. You could have another DAG and uh, you, you are maybe say this DAG will find transformation, transformation alone. And uh, so all this, if you have multiple DAGs in your system, DAGs we will show you all the DAGs that are there. Then we also have the graph view, uh, the graph view. And in your graph view, you can now visualize this, your workflow, what happens after what, and uh, maybe any dependencies that are required. So the graph view will show you that uh, af after this DAG, this comes next. After this DAG, this comes next. Maybe, and um, we have this status that the graph shows us and they're represented in colors. You can tell the green shows us that the that DAG, that specific task was successfully completed. We have the yellow showing that it failed once, but the executor is retrying it. It's because you said after 10 seconds, wait another 10 seconds and then retry again that that same that same process. So when you instead of following what is happening on the back end, Airflow gives you this interface to actually monitor what is going on with your DAGs. And uh, this is what happens. Then you also have the trivial, which as well just represents the DAG, what comes after what, what comes after what. So I know we'll go deeper into Airflow, I think tomorrow. Yeah, we'll go deeper into Airflow tomorrow and uh, we'll see all of this in action. So that's basically just which will be open this week. I don't know if there is any question, anything you did not get. I'd now leave the floor to any questions you have. Maybe just to ask, have I given uh, you an idea of what is going on to happen this week? Do you know now how you're going to use these three tools, how they'll help you. Okay, I have a yes from Ken. A yes from Daisy. One more yes, then I think uh, we can conclude. Ah, okay, that is nice. So in the next 
to I think three days all the way to Thursday morning. We'll go deeper into each of these tools and actually show them in action, show them their code and how to create a topic and how to actually do this DAGs and do a scheduling. Yeah, we'll go deeper into them in the next three days. So that was it for this class, just a basic introduction, and I hope that helped to stop sharing. If you have any question, you can just uh, reach out on Slack. And I think uh, from there, it's uh, just happy coding. I think I have another meeting as well.